good morning. Good morning and uh, welcome to uh, this uh, workshop on artificial intelligence at the European Commission. My name is Lucilla Scioli. I'm director at DigiConnect of the European Commission for Artificial Intelligence and Digital Industry. And I am, uh, you know, one of those who have been uh, uh, fighting hard to, to get a, an artificial intelligence policy off the ground. Uh, so we are very pleased to organize this first workshop of, on artificial intelligence, which is organized and articulated around the high-level group of, of experts on artificial intelligence, as well as a larger group of uh, still experts uh, that, that we know of. Um, and uh, we, we really hope to be able to get out of this workshop a lot of creativity and a lot of new ideas. Now, uh, the workshop will actually be run by uh, the chair of the high-level group of experts who's sitting next to me, and that's uh, uh, Mr. Pekka Ali Pietila. And he will be helped, and he was, if you remember, selected uh, as, a, as a chair at the first meeting of the high-level group, which took place in June, at the end of June this year. He will be uh, helped, and uh, uh, he will work with two vice chairs. Uh, we have Ms. Uh, Noja Bujema, uh, who leads the work on the ethical guidelines, and we have Mr. Barry O'Sullivan, who uh, leads the work on the policy. So I will leave to them the organization and the chairing of the, 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 the whole workshop, but I would like to tell you a couple of words just to put this workshop in context, because many of you are from the high-level group and already, little, already know what the Commission is doing in this area. But as we have invited more people than the high-level group, I thought it was maybe useful to give you in very few words the European context in which this work is taking place. Uh, so this, uh, this group and this activity was launched in a communication that was published in April, a Commission communication on artificial intelligence. In that communication, we highlighted the fact that we observed a certain investment gap in terms of artificial intelligence of Europe compared to other parts of the world, and that we wanted to fill this gap, and we wanted to put in place a set of policies that would help us to fill this gap. Now, we strongly believe that Europe may be a little bit late compared to other parts of the world, but there is still room for catching up, and we have a very positive attitude about it. Uh, we, we know that there are strengths in Europe, and these strengths notably rely in our research labs, in our strong researchers, in a strong robotics segment that is also developing AI, in business-to-business -business applications, and also in a strong industrial tissue that we have in Europe, which is obviously going to be very important for the uptake and the impact of these technologies. Now, because, of, um, the, uh, because we want to increase our investment gap, we are talking and we're working very closely with European member states to make sure that not just the European Commission, but everybody across the board is, has enough incentives to, to increase investments. We're working with member states. We are actually developing with them a so-called coordinated action plan. This is an action plan where member states will declare their intentions and the areas where they're willing to collaborate, exploit synergies, and therefore increase investment, and it will be published before the end of the year. So pay attention to that work, also because it's very linked to what you're doing here. In fact, um, we think that for bringing Europe um, to the next level in artificial intelligence, we have to work on two levels. We have to work on making sure that developments are taking place following the European values. We have a set of fundamental values we want to respect, and the work on the ethical guidelines are really going to make sure that developments and that enterprises who develop and who use artificial intelligence will do that in what we call a human-centric approach. And secondly, we want to make sure that the, policy and the, that, that the policy is in place to foster an ecosystem that can really facilitate the development and the uptake of artificial intelligence in Europe. So because of this, we have given two tasks to the high-level group. The first one is to develop ethical guidelines and 
suggestions for implementations of these guidelines. And the second one is to develop policy recommendations. So the, the policy recommendations now are intended to us in the Commission now. Keep in mind that the legislature is ending in the European Union, so there will be Parliament elections in June, and a new Commission that will come into work at the end of the year. And so these recommendations will very much fuel and will be an input also to the work of the next Commission. So um, you are invited today to contribute to the work. There are very specific questions you will be invited to, to answer to. Um, uh, the work of this high-level group is linked to the work of the member states, and uh, in Finland uh, next month, the members of the high-level group will have the opportunity of meeting the member states and the people in the member states who are responsible for the development of artificial intelligence. <laughs> they really have to work together because you can imagine that if each member state develops its own ethical guidelines, for example, we're going to end up with 28 different ethical guidelines and there goes the single market. So it's very important that this development takes place at the European level. And also in terms of policy, the suggestions that you bring now, they will, you know, you will be producing a uh, a paper or an output that, that will be available in 2019, but this is already useful for the member states and their action plan. So the interaction between the group and the member states is extremely important. Last but not least, it's very important that this discussion in Europe is not only confined, let's say, to the experts of the high-level group, but that we engage all the developers and the people that have a stake in artificial intelligence at large. It's difficult to bring people to Brussels, but you know, we are talking artificial intelligence, so of course we have an online platform. It's the Alliance platform. Um, I know many of you are active on that platform. I would like to uh, invite you to continue being active there because it's very important that we are fully transparent in terms of this work with, uh, with the platform. In fact, uh, the workshop today are actually, um, uh, will be uh, transmitted also on the platform. And uh, um, uh, make sure that in your work in general, you are as inclusive as possible. It's very important that Europe is at the forefront. We are a democratic continent and we want to continue to have very wide uh, discussions in all the member states. <coughs> Having said that, I give the floor to Pekka Ali Pietila. As I said, he's the chair of the high level group. He will be running the whole day with uh, the two vice chairs. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lucy. And thank you for setting the scene and the backdrop, which is crucial to understand in an environment which is moving fast and it's very complex. My name is Pekka Ali Pietila. Welcome to our second workshop. Our first one was in end of June, and um, based on the work we did during the June workshop, we had key themes, which we have, uh, as we agreed, according to our working mode. We have now had two iteration rounds, a lot of input from you, a lot of food for thought. Based on that input, based on the dimensions you have taken up, um, we have taken the first step to establish already the, let's say, 0.1 version of the framework. How should we frame it? And uh, Nosha will discuss the framing on the ethics side having the intent and then the implementation, and implementation having two different parts, framing for that part. And Barry will cover the framing on the policy side, starting from the impact, because we want to create an impact, and then what are the enablers for supporting that impact part. Today we will dig deeper to those specific topics which are crucial within this first framing. And that will mark the new way of working, commence, commencement of digging deeper and getting more practical. And uh, 
later today we will then go through how we would like to run it, but it will follow the same basic philosophy. Iterative rounds and then the power of voluntarism. So it's your passion to certain topics or multiple topics which we are looking for. We are looking for your calling in certain specific things where you want to contribute. And that's the way where we, we will, with the iterative manner, go deeper and get really concrete, practical, and have the crucial substance then packaged within the frame. Um, the framing in the discussion and the ideas you have been submitting, the framing is not only covering the what should we do, but also how. How do we make sure that whatever we come up with at the end of our work, that that can be implemented and that will have an impact? And I would leave you with two thoughts which have emerged, not to be discussed yet. We will come to the governance part and the how part later in our workshops, not today, but in, in later workshops. But the one perspective is that we need to think in terms of at least 10 year horizon. So if we don't think our actions today keeping in mind that there's a longer term horizon towards we need to work and then make sure that there are actions on a rolling basis, the most impactful actions at any point of time, taking into account what has happened in the past and how the circumstances have changed, we don't get to the level of pace and speed which would allow us to catch up US and China and the others. And then the second aspect of the how is that how do we keep the big picture? Because this group, once we are finishing, we have created a great amount of collective wisdom and knowledge and network. So how do we make sure that the big picture is kept and the collective wisdom is preserved and then how do we spread that probably in the form of network of networks. So food for thought for you as well. Please keep the how part in mind. Once we go further, we will revisit that in November and in, in, in December sessions. Um, timelines, you and Lou, uh, Natalie will show the timeline has not changed, but um, it would be great if we could have the first draft from the ethics side and from the policy side all ready for comments, probably at the level of 60% maturity by the end of this year. And it would make sense to keep these two pieces of work in sync. So not thinking that we could go out first with the ethics and then come with the policy because they are linked. Um, so that's about the bigger picture. Today, just one um, practical thought. Uh, this work, when we go to these specific topics, and we have a lot of creativity, a lot of wisdom, a lot of brain power, we still would like to tease a bit of more in innovativeness and creativity out of you. And today we have a test. There's a one group which will have a different way of facilitating the session. There are experts here in Brussels uh, who will do that. And we see how it goes. If it goes well, we will expand that one for the coming sessions, because once we dig deeper, it's getting harder. It's harder to find the new ways of thinking, breaking the mold, and, and having something which would make a really difference. So let's see how that works. Um, NOSA will now cover the ethics part, Barry will take the policy side, and then you need to listen very, very carefully, Natalie. <laughs> <laughs> because the art of logistics <laughs> will be crucial today, and, and Natalie is the master of the logistics. So with that, over to you, NOSA. Okay, thank you, Becca. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Noza Pujema, Director of Research uh, at Enria. And um, I will uh, introduce uh, this uh, piece of work 
about um, AI ethics, and you have um, for sure seen that uh, we are moving to a trusted AI uh, in terms of, uh, in fact, our ultimate objective is to um, um, think and provide guidelines and a sort of checklist about how to achieve trust in AI technologies because we believe that um, it's very important to um, uh, this, uh, I mean, the trust is, um, uh, um, is a property of technology in terms of um, economic competitiveness. And all stakeholders um, have to be committed to uh, develop this uh, trusted AI. And um, in this way, uh, in fact, uh, we believe that in the first um, workshop, we have more discussed uh, the values and uh, the idea is to move on, in fact, uh, since there are plenty of um, existing reports, white papers all over the world talking about values. So, so our um, purpose is not to uh, deliver yet another report talking about uh, uh, values. I think we do not, all of us, have a um, very, really big added value with regards to other reports. So the idea is to have a sort of... Uh, um, uh, in fact, uh, highlight and summary what are the values that comes uh, that come out from different existing reports um, in terms of um, uh, uh, ethical intent. So uh, uh, that's where we see core values and uh, principles. But in the same time, um, when we say ethical values. In fact, even if we address these values, it is not sufficient to achieve trusted AI because there is another side which was not, in fact, uh, mentioned in our first uh, workshop. That means the non-intentional discrimination that still can happen uh, only because of lack of accuracy in terms of uh, technological deployment. And that's why um, the idea is to look inside uh, how to implement the trusted AI um, from the responsible AI perspective, but also from the robustness of AI technology. So responsible AI, what does it mean? Uh, what, what are the ideas behind? And in fact, the idea through this workshop is to build a common understanding of what's behind responsible AI and um, I mean, we expect that uh, responsible with, uh, refers to um, compliance to um, regulation, but also compliance to these core values and principles. So how to implement, uh, uh, um, I mean, the uh, compliance of AI technologies to, with respect to these values, but also to legal framework. Uh, this is one side. The other side is about robust AI. That means uh, how to ensure the robustness, reproducibility, um, I mean, uh, uh, robustness against bias and several other sources of uh, vulnerability of uh, AI technologies. And then um, come up with, in fact, the ultimate goal of, of uh, uh, this working group is to provide outcomes uh, in terms of comprehensive checklist and uh, guidelines based on use cases. And that's why in the agenda we have uh, at the very, I mean, um, the, the last uh, session is at least with regards to this working group, with regards to use cases, because the idea is not to discuss um, abstract concepts, but uh, we need to think at the very beginning about use cases so that uh, our approach need to be very operational and guidelines and checklists need to be concrete. So I invite you to think about what kind of mechanism should we develop to implement the trusted AI. So uh, there are some ideas um, uh, with regards to mechanism, maybe by design, maybe through auditability. What does it mean? How to ensure it? Traceability also. So these are, I mean, um, the big picture for uh, what we have to think about today, but also in terms of uh, guideline for the following steps with regards to this uh, deliverable. Okay. <laughs> I already commented the second slide. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Nasha.
Barry, please. Great. So, um, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Barry O'Sullivan. I'm from University College Cork in Ireland, and I'm um, director of the Insight Centre for Data Analytics there. Um, I'm also the president of the European AI Association. Um, so, obviously, I'm a, an academic by background. Um, so, I'm chairing the working group focused on policy and investment recommendations. Um, and I suppose if we can go to the next slide. Um, so, the way we're going to, given the feedback that we've received so far, um, version 0.1, as, uh, as Pekka mentioned, we're looking at this from, I suppose, along three different dimensions. So, the ambition within Europe is that by 2020, there will be a 20 billion per annum uh, investment in AI across the entire system, both from the Commission, industry, um, uh, member states, and so on. Um, and if you think about if you think about that for a minute, you know, if someone was to put 20 billion uh, euros in a big box in the in the middle of the room and told us to spend it on fantastic things in AI, the big question is, well, where would you even begin, right? So the um, so let's not worry about where the money is going to come from, but let's let's worry about, I suppose, the scale of the challenge and also the impact that we're trying to achieve. So I suppose the first dimension is that of impact. And given the feedback so far, we see four dimensions that impact so far. Uh, one is AI uptake. And so how you read this, basically, is that there are a large number, uh, there's a large proportion of companies that are currently not on the not on a significant AI journey yet, but will be. Um, and I suppose, how do we help those kinds of companies to achieve, um, to, to get on that ladder and, and to accelerate? There are a smaller proportion of companies, probably larger, more mature companies, um, that are already on a significant AI journey. And the question here, the challenge for them, is how, how do we assist them in scaling up that activity? And so that's the AI uptake piece. So how do we, how do we get, um, I suppose, this is industry focused primarily. So how do we get European industry to really benefit from the opportunities that AI creates? So what are the issues around that? Um, what are the th what are, and I suppose, what are the specific impacts? Not the, not the things we're going to do to make those impacts happen, but what are the impacts themselves? So when we look back. Um, in 2023 or four or five, that we know that there was a significant positive benefit um, to what we've achieved in these um, in this deliverable in terms of the uptake of AI. In terms of ecosystems, I suppose what we're trying, what we're saying here, this is this is gathering together the need to create environments uh, within the European system that create the opportunities for collaboration, for um, for education, for research. Uh, for um, for all of these things, uh, these are industry ecosystems. So these can be everything from, you know, the startup community to um, the large European industrial community. This can be by sector. So it can be automotive. It can be uh, it can be financial. It can be health. Um, so I suppose we want to think broadly in terms of ecosystems. So what are the ecosystems we would like to see emerging? How would we incentivize those? How what kind of what are the what are the opportunities that we can create if we had a large investment? Now, obviously, um, side by side here is a world class research capability. So we uh, obviously Europe is strong in research, both industrial and in academic research. Um, but how do we lift our game significantly? So the next time somebody talks about the where is the greatest place in the world for doing AI research, you know. Um, you know, we're up there with the Canadas and with the uh, with the United States and with the Chi with the Chinas. You know, as you know, maybe not as equals as as people who are you know ahead of that game, right? So how do we so how do we achieve that world class research capability? Um, and obviously, we need citizen engagement. One of the biggest challenges we have in AI is that it's both overhyped and underhyped. You know, so it's exaggerated in one sense, and then it's it's underplayed in others. And so, how do we how do we get citizens to really understand what is real and what is not in the context of AI? How do we get how do we get uh, how do we create a 
a citizenry that understands AI and understands the opportunities in the same way as we did with the with the personal computer, for example. So these are the impacts. And I suppose then the the levers that we see ourselves having access to, and I suppose this is where we then set policy. So I suppose the policy is, in some sense, what we want to achieve, and then the enablers are the how, not the how in the terms of in terms of governance and so on. That Pekka said we'll, we'll cover later. But you know, these are the levers that we have to to create investment decisions, uh, policy decisions. So, for example, funding investments. So, how should we how should we fund these various things? So, you know, if we have a big box of 20 billion euros. So how do we distribute that money across the uh, across the system to create these impacts? Physical infrastructure, we should interpret that broadly. That's um, people will think of that as equipment, but it's also educational infrastructure. It's uh, it could even be mobility kind of infrastructure. Um, but I suppose we want to keep this as tangible and real as possible. Um, talent and skills is obviously very, very important. So this is education, this is uh, training of people in situ, uh, all these sorts of things. What kind of um, what can we do about data to um, to enable these impacts? Um, we say smart regulation. I suppose here, you know, appropriate regulation. So what is the appropriate level of regulation? We don't want to over-regulate AI, uh, but at the same time, th we want. AI to be um, deployed in a responsible manner. So what is the appropriate mechanism for that? And of course, there's the communication to the public, which is very, very important. So how do we articulate what it is that, that AI is all about? Um, and that feeds in to, uh, to, to, the, to these impacts. So I suppose the question then is, how, do we, how could we imagine the deliverable shaping up? And I suppose that's what the little box in the center is intended to, to get us thinking about. So I suppose. I would encourage you to think about the impacts at one dimension, the enablers at another, and in the cells where they intersect, this is where we write a particular set of recommendations. So for example, you know, to create you know, world-class research capability, there's funding, there are specific things we would need to do around funding investment, physical infrastructure, and talent, for example. Um, to create AI uptake, again, there is funding and investment in terms of uh, uh, capital for you know investing in venture capital in equity in grants there's how do we uh, train retain and um, uh, and attract um, talent these sorts of things so I suppose in each of these boxes we sh we can think about that these are the places where we say how are we going to use the enablers to achieve the impacts and obviously I'm not suggesting that it's going to be a it's going to be a six by four box but um, but I suppose in these intersections there are this is where the recommendations occur so I think we should be thinking a recommendation at least initially uh, we're thinking of it as what do we do with our enablers to achieve an impact um, and I suppose we need to settle on the impacts we need to settle on the enablers and then we need to write these uh, these recommendations I suppose what you'll be doing over the next while is actually addressing that so I suppose you know if we had to rush to a deadline for tomorrow as I usually do uh, so um, and we're writing a document you know the document we could see would have a have a um, a table of contents like this and what we'll be encouraging you to do and Natalie will talk about this in a while is we would like you to contribute to specific aspects of these so you might feel very strongly about how to advance AI uptake and we would like you to contribute to that um, you might feel that you have a lot to say about uh, achieving world-class research capability and how you know what Europe's physical infrastructure policy should be around that and get involved in those two activities and I suppose um, what we, but what we really want to focus on is, you know, if the European Commission are putting in a pot of money, at the end of the day, the big question is how are we going to lever how are we going to excite the system as a whole to the extent that that money is massively leveraged? And you know, with the greatest respect to my Commission colleagues, um, if what we do as a policy isn't exciting, then we don't achieve any of these impacts to, to, to some extent. So it's really about creating something that's very, very exciting. Research and innovation you see at the bottom is something that we're, that it's separate because in some sense it's both an impact and an enabler. And I suppose what we want to achieve here is think about what are the big research challenges um, that we want to achieve, in, that we want to undertake in Europe. So these, so we don't want, we, we don't just want moonshots. We also want some fairly significant moon landings, right? So these are not to be completely aspirational. We want these to be big, but we want them to be big and achievable. 
And, um, and I suppose later in the process, we'll come back to the question of governance. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. And then, Nathalie, how do we work it out? OK. Time is running short. So I will try Sorry, to be. Oh. No, one question, please. Uh, ask a question, please. Please. Uh, so I'm Nuria Oliver, and I have many hats, but I wanted to ask my question as the spokesperson for the Spanish high level group on artificial intelligence. <coughs> so my question is what do you think would be the most uh, productive way to interact with the member states, high level groups who are in the process of writing their own? Uh, a strategic white paper on the topic to be maximally aligned with the activity of this group, but also to exploit synergies. Uh, some member states have already written <coughs> their documents, but for example, like Spain is a great opportunity because we are in the process of writing it. It's been delayed because of the change of government, so I just take it as a good sign to be more aligned with this, uh, with this group. So I'm very curious to know how do you see that we can move forward, because our book is due to be finished in the next, next two to three months. Um, so how can we make sure that whatever rec we recommend in that book is aligned with these recommendations so actually all the pieces of the puzzle fit together? It's a very, very good comment and, and note. And that will be a it's not a challenge, but it will be a thing where we need to find all the different connections to match with different networks. So in, it's kind of a network of networks where we, by different uh, teams, by different, even individuals, we make sure that there is a, as much of alignment and communication as possible. There are meetings with day and AI. Day is Please. Day means digitizing European industry and AI group. And that okay. is member state. Uh, I know. So I, I already told the Spanish government because yeah. there is also miscommunication in the Spanish government between the different ministries yeah. because it was a different ministry. So I think this is already aligned. Uh, but with this group, I'm not sure there is any alignment because I'm the I'm the spokesperson of the Spanish group, but I. I'm involved with this not because I am the spokesperson of the group, but because of my expertise on AI. So there hasn't been any kind of alignment right now. If I can Please. Yeah, so um, I guess there's, there's multiple ways of achieving that alignment. First of all, well, it's great to have you here, right? So, <laughs> so you're the vehicle in some sense. You're, well, you're one of the mechanisms. Um, next month, uh, and I guess we'll discuss this later on, uh, our next meeting is going to be in Helsinki, which is at the AI Forum, which is the ministerial, which is primarily the ministerial level meeting, and so that'll be an opportunity for us as a group to communicate with with that with that cohort as a group, and obviously that'll be done, uh, you know, in taking them as a group. But I suppose it also provides us opportunities to engage with those directly. Um, obviously, you know. There is the sort of mundane mechanism, and I don't mean that to disrespect, but there's the sort of standard mechanism of ensuring that whatever documentation and information there is about the policy is available to everybody here, but also the AI Alliance members to the AI Alliance platform. Um, so I suppose what I would encourage everybody to do, we all have many roles and many hats, and I think if you are aware of a stakeholder group, then I suppose in the spirit of collaboration, we want to make sure that if you do have even a small voice representing someone, that, that that voice should, you know, please do represent that voice, I suppose. And as said, the, the, we make, uh, we publicize as we go. So, so the transparency of the work, what we do, is one of the key means to communicate where we are with our thinking. So connecting with that would be one way of tackling all the different facets of the work which is underway under this high-level expert group. But that's a very relevant question. Please. Yeah, I can only, uh, I can only agree to that. As a group, we need to find some, some structured way of doing that. Uh, one thing that um, we, when we worked in the high-level group for, uh, for digitalizing industries and, and uh, uh, defining the key enabling technologies, amongst others, the AI, 
Uh, I was very inspired by the way that we worked with uh, missions and visions. And uh, I really think it's super concrete, and I love it, because it's very concrete, and it gives uh, something to give input to. I think one thing that I'm missing is really, what is the EU vision? I mean, what is the mission statement? Is it that, you know, the governments uh, want to create a, the world-class health services for the citizens? So really taking that view of who, they, who are the receivers? So the citizens are definitely linked very closely to the government. So what is it that the government sector will deliver uh, to the citizens enabled by AI? Uh, I think that it will be a very important uh, part of uh, to winning the hearts and souls of the Europeans that we are able to tell that we do it in uh, the European way or the third way or whatever it's, uh, it's called at the moment uh, and what we want to achieve with AI in Europe. Uh, you could say the same for competitiveness. So uh, one thing is the citizens. What type of uh, competitiveness? Are there specific sectors? Uh, is it specific ecosystems that we want to create to make the Europe more competitive? So maybe seeing it a bit like, of course, there is a very big interact between private and public sector, but what are the concrete goals and areas that we as a European society would like to enhance with the AI? And if we want to kind of um, win the hearts also of populist um, arguments of bad tech, uh, I think we need to win uh, the hearts back with these kind of visions and, and concrete initiatives, and also really uh, to uh, make sure that the governments um, have guidelines on where to do their investment of the EU funding. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, uh, thank you for the comment. Uh, um, in fact, in terms of uh, concrete uh, outcomes, the, the, uh, the idea is to uh, how to concretely align the technological progress of AI to human values, which is really specific to Europe, and we need to put it forward uh, and not to stick to high-level uh, concepts, but uh, really implementation. That's why we move slightly the outcome of the work, uh, Working Group 1. And in fact, within Working Group 1, uh, we'll have the opportunity to identify also research and innovation new directions to implement the trusted AI, but at the same time, identify what are the gaps in terms of policy, do we need policy, what uh, the existing policy, maybe we can, um, I mean, live with the existing policy, but we need maybe more technological other things. So this is the scope of the discussion and uh, uh, the outcome. And, and another side is to have to how to develop more um, and to deploy AI technology, I mean, in the uh, European landscape. But if I if I would continue on that, I think the mission vision part will will need to address. Um, the in some areas that is foreseeable that we could have quite clear statements, and I would say that those, on the policy sides it's easier, in one way, and and the impact part is is forming one. because it's also aspirational what we are now saying. Vision, mission, aspiration, how high we can, what is the way of setting the goals and targets? And the target setting is crucial. Um, I think we will learn when we, once we go further how the cooperation and what are the stands we can take on a member state level, because the alignment with commission and the member state part is absolutely crucial that these actions are aligned. And there we, I think we will learn by discussing and also consulting what the other groups are doing. What are the best ways of making sure that the, the way how we are articulating then matters which are related to the member state part is finding a welcoming audience there. And, and therefore, we'll, but very good statements and we come back to those in, in due course. And, and not to over-answer the question, but just add one point. I think we are, we, we are collectively an independent group of experts. We are not the Commission, right? So, uh, you know, we don't represent the Commission in any way. Um, and obviously the Commission have articulated their position 
in you know, their communication and AI and various other documents. And I think we should take those as inputs. But I suppose the great opportunity, as far as I'm concerned, in the context of artificial intelligence, is that we have no idea what the world is going to look like in five years' time. Um, and that is, that's basically the opportunity we have. I think we get to tell that story. We get to set that vision. Um, and I think we should be ambitious and we should be brave. Um, and I suppose if we come up with something that is sufficiently convincing and wonderful, and I think there is, there is incredible brain power in this room, then um, I hope the, uh, the Commission will support it. But um, I think the mission and vision, I think, is ours to make in some sense. And now in the capacity of a chairman, I declare the discussion over. over. <laughs> and then looking at Natalie, who is almost <laughs> taking this, and now if we want to run this, OK, there will be a, a, a separate session at the end of the day for all open questions, matters which are critical. So now this is um, shuffling between the concrete and, and, and high level. Now we go to the concrete part. So Natalie. Thank you, Peck. Hold on to your questions. There will be more time for that in the plenary session in the afternoon and for the experts of the high-level expert group in our separate meeting. So you, you, your question will be heard. And now we have a schedule to follow, so we are going to move on. Uh, you will see on this slide all the different breakout sessions that are taking place. We have four different rooms in two buildings. Two in this building, two in the hotel, which is really just next door. Um, we've tried to use color coding to make it as easy as possible. Um, you find these color codes on your name tags. You will find them on the lists that are posted here and outside of the room and in your inbox because I sent them to you uh, yesterday evening already. So um, the way it will work is that you will install yourself in a moment in the four different breakout rooms that were allocated to you. And the moment you will sit down and start discussing, you already have the background document which contains the questions that you should discuss and the focus point. So your aim will be to find a meaningful answer to these questions. It will be limited time uh, and probably heated discussions, but uh, that will be fun. And uh, at the end of the day, you will report these conclusions. When you go and sit down into your breakout room, Amongst yourself, you will need to choose a moderator and a rapporteur. Uh, we already used this method in June for those who were there. You volunteer. So self-organizing, self-regulation, you choose amongst yourself a moderator and a rapporteur. The moderator carefully looks at the questions that need to be answered, reiterates these are the questions, and tries to find an answer together. The rapporteur will have the task at the end of the day, at three, when we come back in plenary, to report the answers to these questions. And now I will be a bit strict in two minutes, because we won't have a lot of time. So rapporteurs, you have a very important task to draw the conclusions from your breakout session and, and present them here to the rest of the group at the end of the day. Um, room 1A. Yellow. If you need to be in room 1A, if your code is yellow, you stay here, you don't move, great for you. The green room, Sofitel Adenauer, I'm asking my colleagues Irina and Cecile to stand up. They will guide you to that room. <laughs> the green room, and you will meet them outside in front of room 1B. OK, so just outside, you go to room 1B, and my colleagues will take excellent care of you and guide you there. Uh, just hold on, not yet. <laughs> I will finish my explanation, and then people stand up. Otherwise, it's going to be a circus. Um, if you need to be in the blue room, room 1C, also relatively easy, you just go to the room across. So you just cross the hallway, you will find it. And my colleagues, Yaro and Christian, there is Yaro, there is Christian, they will guide you there. So it's very easy, you can find your way, room 1C, across the hallway. Then finally, the most important room, Sofita Malfatti, that's myself and my colleague Tapio. We will guide you to the hotel, it's not a far walk, and we will meet you at the couches. I guess you all saw the couches over there, we will go there in group together. One more thing. Uh, 
there are few people who forgot to register because the registration system, you had to do a double registration, it was a little bit complicated. If you were not allocated a room, I suggest you either stay here in room 1A or you go to room 1C. Okay? So that is the easiest because it's the biggest room and you can choose you know, your topics based on that. I think it's very clear for everyone. Back Let's here, go. Back and back here for lunch. Lunch will take place on the fourth floor. So this is, please, it's also noted in the agenda, but at 12.30, lunch on the fourth floor. You will find it.